Hi, my name is Louise Wadley and I'm director of the Hebden Bridge Film Festival and I am delighted to be interviewing the directors for the Shorts programme. And today we've got Celia Willis and Emily Stein, the directors of Magic Land. So, hi Celia, hi Emily. Hello. Lovely to see you. So let's just dive straight in. Magic Land is just, as it sounds, so wonderful and this character of Jenny Mayers is amazing. Tell me how you met her. So I, I was, um, yeah, I was looking through, because I'm a photographer uh, as well. And so I was looking through photos of just, I always collect photos of people that are amazing that possibly could photograph one day. And me and Celie were thinking about film ideas of something we wanted to do together. And we came across this photo of Jenny and uh, Celie was like, uh, hello, uh, I mean, who's that? She's amazing. And so we had a chat about it and uh, we were like, well, yes. I mean, we were, we've always been very interested in magic and the idea of magic and women in magic and lack of women in magic. Um, and Jenny is obviously amazing in so many different ways. So yeah, it was kind of a no brainer, wasn't it Celia? Yeah, it was a, once we saw that photo, I couldn't really believe that Em kind of knew her and she was real. And then we met yeah. her and she's obviously so lovely and warm and up for things. It was just like a simple, yeah, great, let's do it. Fantastic. And, t and tell me, um, Celia, you and Emily have been working as a team for some time. How long ago did you start working together? Well, so we met on our foundation at Art College at Camberwell. Um, so we've always worked on different stuff. We, we did a lot of um, stuff with teenage girls. We had an organisation called We Are Photo Girls that was all about exploring fashion photography and kind of handing the camera back over to teenage girls, getting them behind the camera and in front of the camera. We did that for years. And then we've also worked a lot on each other's creative projects. So, I don't know, Emily might help me style or art direct something. I might help Emily cast something. And then we were like, oh, it'd be really nice to do something that is fully together. So that's when we started looking for an idea that could suit both of our backgrounds and bring us together on one project. It's, it's fantastic and it's such a beautifully realized gem. The thing I'm really intrigued about um, is the aesthetic. So the aesthetic of the film is just this delicious layer that adds so much to the story. Where, where did that come from and how did that come about? Well, we, we were so sorry we were quite I because I'm from more of a documentary background and Celia's more from a you know the world of creating scenes and worlds and so it was a real combination of me pulling to be in a real world and Celia being like let's make it really fantastic and so I think it's probably the reason yeah it, it's got Celia's like idea of like creating these other unique worlds, plus the reality of me working in docu more documentary and wanting it to feel still real emotions, but mixed with these very art directed setups and scenes. And, um, and, and see these crazy ideas of stuff like the head coming across and me being like, well, how the hell is that gonna work? She's like, it's fine, I've done stuff like this before. And I was like, ah, but actually I think it's like, it's the two things coming together that makes something quite unique because it feels really fanciful but then at the same time like really real too so Absolutely. I, th I think it's that combination so Celia you obviously had had the faith that the disembodied head going across the lounge <laughs> over yeah. would work because it's brilliant yeah I, I I kind of like Em says I, I work a lot with kind of physical so that kind of stuff doesn't freak me out and and also we had a great movement director and we had a day with her and Jenny and Natalia and they were just clowning, like, you know, they just all were messing around and, and showing us crazy stuff they could do physically. I mean, Jenny is, could wipe the floor with both me and Emily in terms of, of how she can throw her body around. Um, so I was like, yeah, they, 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 they can do it. Um, I think like Em says, it's that really great thing when you work with someone else, like actually your differences are the middle between your differences is where you get something really incredible rather than like, oh, we're both into the same thing. It's actually really interesting to mix two things that don't normally get mixed. I think that's really important for people to understand. Film, to me, is such a collaborative form. And if you can get that collaboration where those incredible uh, kind of differences can be your strengths, because I agree with you what Emily said about there's something incredibly natural 
uh, and un, um, there's not any, although some of the scenes are clearly performed for the camera, Jenny, the relationship you have with her as the filmmakers is very clear and that's what comes across. And having made a number of documentaries and particularly, you know, dealing with the fact that most of the time we have um, kind of reality TV masquerading as documentary these days. Um, that's why I was very interested in this because Jenny's relationship to you is very clear from the camera. It's very calm. I'm, I'm curious um, because of something I made many years ago about Punch and Judy and the kind of uh, close society. That's a whole other conversation about Punch and Judy, but the magic circle I believe is very close. So I'm curious, an older black woman being part and parcel of that. Tell me about that. I think the way Jenny described it to us, and I wouldn't want to put words in her mouth, but I think, um, and you probably remember this as well, she had met a magician, um, an older man who was a magician, who had seen her perform, and he thought she was amazing. And I think from that relationship, he was really keen to put her in touch with the magic circle. I think this is how it happened. Um, and from that, she managed to get kind of on their radar. Um, because she was always very much on the outside of everything, um, just doing her one-woman shows. Like as she said, when she graduated from drama school, there just weren't parts for women who looked like her. So she just did her own thing um, and basically made her own work to give herself that platform to create. Oh, she's she's absolutely wonderful. Emily, you must have been very taken by her as a subject for documentary. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, she's... she's I mean, I think that that's the thing of you know, I guess sometimes when you start making things, I remember I, when I started working in documentaries and I used to like, there was this one director who I worked with and he said, I was like on the phone and I was like talking to people and I was like, you know, this is my, you know, I'm trying to be professional voice. And he was like, you're really goofy. You just need to be goofy because like, you just need to be yourself and let people feel like you're just connecting with them. And with Jenny, I mean, she is naturally so goofy. And she's so open and so silly. And I think we just wanted to make sure that you get that warmth from her. And the fact that she is so able to like still just be so playful. And I think like particularly now at this point in time, it's like we all need to reconnect with that, you know, that not getting so stressed and worried and anxious and, you know, and just her kind of love and, and um, love for just exploring and being playful and creative. So yeah, I mean, she's amazing. She's like a gem, obviously. Yeah, and I, I want to say, we need to wrap up now, but I wanted to say there's two things. One is just the very fact of having a film about her says so much. So, so wonderful to have her as the centerpiece of a film because we just don't see enough women, older black women, where are they, what are they doing? We just don't see them enough on the screen. And 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 I love the intergenerational stuff with her granddaughter and and all that sort of thing. Could you give us? We've just got to finish up. I'd love to know any projects in the pipeline together coming up or your part. Celia, oh, so I'm I'm working on a couple of new projects, a couple of shorts, um, which hopefully I might drag M into. <laughs> He'll be picking up the phone later. <laughs> um, yeah, just just keep prepping stuff. Particularly at the moment, it's just good to have lots of things that are ready to go. But yeah, more shorts hopefully out very soon. We want them. Thank you. <laughs> really nice to meet you. Thank you for having us. Yeah, and thank you so much, Hebden Bridge Film Festival. Absolutely loved having you on board. So lovely to see you and we'll catch you again soon. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Bye. So I'm delighted to welcome uh, Maya Yadlin, director of Fine. Maya, lovely to see you. Lovely to see you. <laughs> And we're talking to you from Tel Aviv, I believe. Yeah, I'm from Tel Aviv. Fantastic. So Maya, your film was just a delight and the aesthetic of how you shot it and everything, I'd love to talk to you. So for people who haven't watched it yet, it's this amazing sort of snapshot of what can happen in families, tiny little incidents that can go so wrong. Can you tell me what the inspiration was for the film? Actually, um, okay, it's me and my family. So uh, it's uh, something that I saw a lot in uh, our dynamics uh, of, in the family. And we had a lot of traveling together. And, you know, when you are in the car, 
it's a it's a really a situation that four of us together and every time I saw all our fights in the in the car and I thought like this is a this is a movie like I need to to write something about that and really it's something that from life it's, it didn't happen you know uh, exactly like that but it's the same we we play our, ourselves so it's some something from life I guess so, so Maya, I wanted to ask you that because this is this is the real life family who are playing themselves. How did you manage to persuade everybody? Because everybody's fantastic. Uh, actually, it's a lot of practicing, but you know, because we we play ourselves, it's not something that we we need to play another character. So, to tell that, just be yourself. It's it's easier and. You know, all the script is something that it's their words and they know how to say it. So, and they really wanted to, to be a part of it. And all my studies in, uh, in school, when I learned um, um, cinema, they all the time were involved of it, with it. So it was really naturally. Well, they're fantastic. I mean, your dad, I, compl I, mean, I believed everybody. I believed you and your sister and your mum and your dad. When people are playing themselves, quite often they get a little bit tense or a little bit self-conscious. But what it felt like in this film was it was so natural that everybody who's been in a family or a group in a car where those arguments happen completely relate. Um, so, you know, I think hats off to all your family for being... Yeah. Number one, allowing themselves to be part of you. <laughs> <laughs> Number two, also, um, you, you're obviously following in great footsteps. I'm not sure if you've seen Jane Campion's early work where she has um, a, a, an argument in a car. Actually, I saw her short film after my teacher, uh, uh, what I saw it after, after the film and I say, oh my God, why well, I didn't see it before. Like, it's really, I, I know uh, Jane Campion, but I didn't saw her short film and it really made me very um, excited to see it. And yeah, there is something that it's also a true family. So there is something similar. I think there's something about, it's, it's almost, a car becomes like a theatre because theatre, a lot of drama in theatre is about exits and entrances. And somehow you're in this box, this traveling box. And when the stakes are up, you know, the box can leave, uh, people can get in or out. And so there's something very exciting. So tell me, can you explain a little bit about what the landscape is we see? Cause it's beautiful and dramatic and yeah it's uh it's in israel in the uh, in north of israel and i wanted to have you know the the difference between the car and uh it's very like 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 you said a box and outside there is a like a desert that doesn't have an end like i wanted this um um difference between the out and the uh, and I think that's why it, it makes the story like we want to get out and where, where I can go. Like I, I will fight with my parents and I, I, where I can go, there, there is nothing outside. So you must deal with the situation and you must stay in the situation. So I think it makes the conflict more, you know, more tense. You have to stay there. You, you really captured that. And so Maya, what's, what's on the horizon for you? Are you developing other projects, other films that we can look forward to? Actually, yeah, I'm, I'm still working with my parents and now we are um, shooting in another month, um, another uh, sh uh, film together. And it's about how it was to film together uh, this film. So it's very interesting to see how a family is uh, shooting a film together. And there is a very nice uh, dynamic there. 
I, I have to say, it, <coughs> excuse me, it's really wonderful to see that relationship mm -hmm. being played out and um, hats off to them for letting you not only explore it in drama, but now in documentary about uh, mm -hmm. making the film. And we really congratulate you on the film. It's a wonderful uh, portrait, a snapshot. It's so economical and yet it captures something really wonderfully universal. So lovely to speak to you, Maya. Thank you very much. It was nice to talk to okay. you. Hi, my name is Louise Wadley and I'm delighted to have Bonnie McRae, the director of Mind Yourself, who uh, has brought this incredible film to us. Bonnie, I was really touched by everything that I saw in the film and I wondered if you could let us know what was the inspiration for the film? Um, yeah, I basically, I came across an article um, that sort of cited Dundee, my hometown, um, as Scotland's suicide capital, which just kind of struck me and, you know, it's just couldn't stop thinking about it. Um, and I guess the film is sort of my reaction to that, to, to that news and that discovery. Um, it was never really intended to be a film. It was actually a poem. I, I, I kind of just sort of, it was my sort of response to what was going on. And then the more I sort of worked on it, the more I could sort of visualize it and see it as maybe something that could actually potentially do some good and try and you know, raise awareness of what's going on in the city. Yeah, and it's very, I mean, for those people who don't know, I think, am I right, Bonnie, that you said Dundee is considered the suicide capital of Scotland? Is that yeah, uh, so it's, um, I mean, no place should be, that's not a title any place would want or should be given. So I think that in itself kind of indicates the sheer, like, enormity of the problem, really. But yeah, it's, it's, um, it's a shame because there's so much good things happening in Dundee, so many young people doing so many amazing things. And I think partly, the film was also to sort of highlight that and to put a focus on the young people. Like everyone in the film is from Dundee. We've sort of tried and like tried to highlight local businesses and you know keep the the sort of strong accent and dialect prominent in the film as well. That was really important to me. Yes, I think um, one of the things I love most about it, apart from I want to talk to you about the young man who does the poem for us, but. I loved the um, the sound. That's what I love is the sound of the rhythm of the voice and, and the whole um, accent and everything is just wonderful. So I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about Stephen who's performing. Yeah, uh, Stephen is amazing. I'm so lucky to now to call him like a really close friend of mine. Um, and he's just, he's just great. He I Basically, I was on the hunt for someone who could act and who also was had a really strong Dundonian accent and was struggling for a while. And then my a friend of mine put me in touch with Stephen. She had seen him in Outlocking, which is on Netflix. Um, and he basically had a pretty big role in that um, and sort of picked an agent up from there. And then his acting career has just taken off. But I was so lucky to have him because he's he's very in demand now. Um, but yeah, he he was so happy to do it. And I think he he sort of, said that he's experienced similar feelings about you know his mental health and he was really happy to be involved in it so yeah I was just really really lucky that he he said yeah to doing it because I think if it wasn't for him I don't think it would be you know um I guess as good as it as it turned out. <laughs> it's that it's that wonderful thing though isn't it of collaboration which I think makes things strong that it's a very beautiful set of words and poetry that you've made but someone who brings their talent to it just yeah. adds those extra layers. And I think when I watched it, I was so struck by his willingness to take himself to the brink with it. Do you want to talk a little yeah. bit about filming him with that? Uh, yeah, so I directed the film as well, as well as writing it. And I, I feel like I didn't even really have to direct him because he was just, he's just, you just knew what the words meant, which I think was the most important. I didn't want someone to act it. I kind of didn't want to, to you know someone to, to feel it and to show how how I wanted it to be really raw and it didn't feel like you know a film I wanted it to feel like it was you were you were opening up to a friend or they were opening up to you and yeah again Stephen is just like didn't like he could just cry on demand I'm like it's, just, it's a talent <laughs> but yeah it was really important to me that he was able to to sort of convey it, it wasn't just words it was emotion he was conveying and I think what what else helped with the film was, like you say, you managed to bring all these different people and images together. So Stephen holds us 
with this extraordinary performance, but then those pictures of different young men and older men and different men, I think that's what also really made the film very powerful was them just looking straight at the camera. In the, do you want to talk about your decision to do that? Yeah, um, I, yeah, originally it was meant to just be Stephen and then the more I was working on it, the more I sort of realised how impactful it might be to the sort of wider community. And then, you know, having, I think a lot of the sort of mental health chat we typically see online is very, it's very sort of done now. It's always like, it's okay not to be okay. And, you know, if that helps someone, that's amazing. But for, I think, especially young people are so used to sort of scrolling on social media now and just like, those words don't mean anything so I really wanted something that would stop people in their tracks and would stop them scrolling and and would you know they could see maybe someone that looks like their dad or someone that you know they might have went to school with I think for me that was the most important thing and to have you know the wide variety of ages of races of backgrounds it was just really important that we sort of included everyone because it does affect everyone in some way I guess so yeah it was just really important yeah, Bonnie, I think um, you've you've really hit something there because it's it's that intersection between specificity and universality. So it's very Dundee. It's very specifically, you know, I completely believe Stephen. I believe everybody who's in the film. But at the same time, it also can apply to so many of us. And I think particularly in lockdown with that pressure cooker on everyone and everyone struggling at different times, even those people who didn't think they would struggle. Yeah. I think you really hit something there. So thank you for making something so beautiful and so yeah. economical and so powerful. And I believe you're, uh, you've been mentored by a, a big friend of HBFF, Hannah Curry. Yeah, big fan of Hannah. Um, we work, we've worked um, on a few projects together and um she's really just helped me out like with everything that like I've never I don't know anyone in the film industry other than Hannah to begin with and she sort of you know just kind of like held my hand and led me down the right tracks and kind of just introduced me to people that could help me out and yeah she's such an inspiration such an amazing filmmaker so really lucky to to have her yeah no i think i think that's that's wonderful and we love having those threads and tell us um bonnie anything that you're sort of writing or thinking about for future projects yeah um so i think with mind yourself it kind of opened my eyes to the sort of power you know words can have and i think um mental health is really important to me and it's something i sort of i'm looking to pursue more um in sort of longer form as well so i'm actually writing um a sort of short film right now about um, endometriosis and the sort of mental um, implications that has on women and um, that's again something that's important to me and I think that's just what I want to continue doing just continue making films that you know I I feel passionately about first because I feel then hopefully other people will feel as as connected to them as, as I do. Well, we, we can't wait to see what you make next. And thank you so much for being part of Hebden Bridge Film Festival. And we'll see you soon when all this is over, we hope. Yeah, I hope so. Thanks so much for having me. It's wonderful to have Nina Ross, the director of The Daring Young Girl on the Flying Trapeze. I'm, I'm worried I'll miss out a word there, Nina. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> Lovely to have you on HBFF Shorts Programme. Well, thanks for having me. Yeah, oh, it's I'm our very pleasure. pleased. It's our pleasure. Nina, um, how are you doing in lockdown? Yeah, yeah, okay. I've, um, I've sort of been struggling through the creative challenges of making films from home. <laughs> but, uh, you know, creative challenges make yeah. different so, things emerge. So it's, it's yeah. still exciting. <laughs> yeah, well, look, we're really, really excited to have this film. I was very, very moved by it. I wonder if you could tell me um a little bit about the inspiration and tell us about nancy willis the artist and how you met and what happened really to bring the film to fruition um so actually nancy was a friend of my mum's since they were children um so i i knew her but i hadn't seen her since i was a child so i didn't really know her as an adult i just knew of her and knew of how just inspiring she is as a creative, as a woman. Um, just hearing stories about the way that she chose 
to live her life and chose to sort of like identify with her disability or with the things that held her back to not let them basically um in a very inspiring way and so i i approached her and asked her if she wanted to make a film and then this process emerged which was a a very ever-changing process it started off with something very little whereby she wasn't even sure if she wanted to be visible in the film but was happy to be audio recorded and ended up with her being so visible that at points of the film you see all of her <laughs> in the bath so she was she in that turn event she really realized that in order to show people her she had to really show people her so that's a wonderful story so as a as a documentary maker and a filmmaker obviously every film is a journey i know it sounds a cliche but it really is a journey with the subject and one of the things that i love about your film is the collaborative nature of the film that it's very clear that nancy is a force to be dealt with and that you you um met as as uh, you know filmmakers and artists and everything like that. Mm. Could you, for people who don't know, tell us a little bit about Nancy and a little bit about, um, you know, what she's been doing and how her life has evolved? Because obviously it's a huge story. Yeah. Um, so Nancy has muscular dystrophy, which she found out when she was very young. And in a nutshell, I guess they, she was always told that she wouldn't live past her teenage years. So the fact that she's now in her late 60s, um, is a testament to her will to live um, and um, the story is really about her sort of it's it's her whole journey but it's really discovering herself through through art so there's this like wonderful meeting of like being a filmmaker and being able to see someone that has discovered themselves through art and then to be able to rediscover someone through another form of art and to make that visible it was quite a beautiful journey because it's so much about Nancy being able to represent herself as a disabled woman in a different light, being able to turn something that is often represented as, um, as Nancy says herself, people being represented as witches or, you know, things that are just really, really horrible representations, being able to show like the beauty of form and life and yeah. I think her, her, her capacity as an artist is really, really strong, isn't it? That she has obviously got an extraordinary deep will to create beyond mm. everything, beyond all the, you know, thick challenges that are, are very, um, some of them really large challenges, but that, that came across in the film. Did you find that you had to, I mean, did you have to, create much or did you just have to be around a lot to try and cover everything? Um, I think that there were, the interesting thing about collaborating was that it meant that our different perspectives created an alchemy, I guess, if you like, of what you see in the film. So whereas Nancy so much wants to show her art and to have this like, gallery of all the things she's created and her expression and I also really wanted to show Nancy for people to be able to observe what an amazing woman she is and the life she's created around her and the sort of moments that you see so I guess we both created different parts of the film in a way which came to give hopefully a more sort of like holistic multi-dimensional view of of her life yeah, I think that really, that alchemy gives the strength to the film. To me, one of the reasons I love the film, apart from discovering about her and what an extraordinary character she is, and, and it's, it's incredibly moving, it's incredibly funny, it's incredibly touching her art and the little animations in between things, but also something about, yeah, it very clear that you as the filmmaker and her as the subject, it was a collaboration. And that, that really does give the film its strength and its dynamism. Mm. Yeah, it would have been an entirely different film if it wasn't made collaboratively. And it wouldn't have been um, a good film. <laughs> how, does Nancy, how does Nancy feel about the film? Yeah, she's really happy with it. It was interesting because throughout the editing process, we had lots of like discussions, like I was going away and editing and then I was coming back and showing her rough cuts and 
there was bits that she wanted to put in it and bits that she wanted to put out of it. So it was very much like process of being like, what are the most important things to her? And in the end, we sort of came to a point where she's really happy with it. Yeah. I'm really pleased to hear you say that because for, for people who don't know, for documentary, the most, to my mind, the most powerful documentaries are the ones where people can collaborate with their subjects, even if it's a very complicated and often emotional process where everyone has to go through a journey of what they accept is going to be in or out. But um, I, can, I can tell that Nancy will have had to have had control. Mm. You and agreed control but I hope that um, yeah I'm glad to hear she's really happy because from an audience point of view it's such a wonderful discovery of her as an artist and to me what's very powerful about the film is obviously there's the journey of disability but there's also the journey of her as a creative person and her development as an artist and what she's doing with her work so that was really mm. powerful thank you for that yeah, she wants, she's going to do a retrospective uh, yeah. soon, so she'll show the film along with all her artwork, so it's all come, you know, not the end of the journey, but, you know, a big moment. Yeah. No, that's really wonderful. And, and Nina, just to finish off, mm. anything in the works? I know that everyone asks that of filmmakers and it drives them mad, but you must have things bubbling away at least. Um, actually, I have a, very, a short film. Uh, uh, of sort of seven minutes that I made last year is going to be screened on BBC Four Arts on Monday, so that's very exciting at 10 p.m. In case anyone wants to watch, um, you tell us the name of the film. It's called Bridging the Gap, and it's another sort of collaboration with an artist, which actually just um, I don't know how it happened, but it seems to be the way my career is going. Um, and it's about um, a young woman who hears voices, so it's a young woman who's struggling with schizophrenia, and it's about her sort of like. Uh, putting a different perspective on that experience. Fantastic. So bridging the gap. Um, I'm hoping that it will be on iPlayer so people can watch it um, because, yeah. uh, you know, after the festival. Nina, it's been yeah. such a pleasure. Uh, we look forward to the day when we can welcome you in person to Hebden Bridge. And thank you so much for your wonderful film. Yeah, thank you very much for screening it and good luck with everything. It's lovely thank to you speak so much. to you. Hello, and I am delighted to welcome Alex Hai and Matab Musur for Veni Eti I Am, the world premiere of the film that we have in our shorts program. Good morning to you both. Hello, wonderful. Hello, people. Hello, and um, first of all, we're, we're absolutely thrilled that you could join us for this little Q&A. I wonder if you first, Alex, could tell us a little bit about, for people who don't know, this film is about um, Venice, it's about you. Uh, has this been something that has been maybe in the works for a long time? Uh, no, not really. Uh, actually, the film, um is more a poetic way to uh, the often overseen difference between being transgender and actually transitioning. Okay. And and let me let me just let everybody know so we're speaking to you from different places. Matab, where are we speaking to you from? From Paris. You're in Paris, fantastic. And Alex, where are you? I'm in Italy. Oh, Sardinia at the morning. You're in Sardinia. Oh, great. So we've got a truly international co-production. And I, want, I wanted to ask you, Matab, obviously this is a really interesting film and a, an incredible collaboration. Can you talk a little bit about what was in your mind when you were trying to bring this story to life? Uh, well, uh, a few years ago, I started to, me to make a documentary about the gondola. Uh, in all aspects and uh, by uh, filming I asked this question if there is any woman interested in this job because I always uh, was interested in the unusual jobs for the woman and uh, at that time by searching on the internet Alex was uh, considered uh, the only woman gondolier so the story started from there and uh, after I met Alex, uh, we had uh, many meetings and uh, I started to, to filming Alex. 
and uh, very quickly I was fascinated by Alex, uh, Alex's characters and uh, um, his journey. <laughs> Yes, it's wonderful. And Alex, I wonder if you could explain to those people who don't know anything about Venice and the world of the gondolier, is this a very um, open society? Can anyone become a gondolier? It's a very tied up, very small uh, cast of uh, uh, selected uh, people, mostly uh, uh, friends of friends and, and, and so on. And uh, it is very male, it is very uh, um, macho, if you want. So um, it is not uh, very much uh, like the idea to, to have a woman in there. Okay. And, and obviously this, this film takes us on a sort of kind of almost it's very beautiful. We see a very kind of almost uh, mythic journey. Could you tell us a little bit about what is the, uh, um, why Pegasus and what, what, what does Pegasus mean to the story? Uh, Pegasus uh, is the name of the, of the gondola and um, he's representing basically an overview and a, and a superior view of, uh, of everything. Uh, let's say an, a not intolerant view um, and uh, a knowing view. So that is the story about that. And, and so I was very interested that every boat has a soul. Is that right? That's correct. And you said that children often somehow know about, about how to relate to the boat. Yes, I found that uh, astonishing, yes. So, so why do you think children have this ability to understand that? Yeah, I think it is just because they are not yet uh, ruined by society. They still have uh, a, a much wider radius uh, than we have. And uh, I think we unlearn those things uh, while growing up. Absolutely. And, and tell me, Alex, what is it that you want us to know from your journey of, you know, over the time, um, as, as Mataba said, you know, she discovered you and then you've obviously gone through different things. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, you know, this is just a little appetizer uh, this is a small, very small movie and uh, for me it was important to, because we have so many assumptions in our days about transgender, most people think it's a new fashion, they think people wake up in the morning and they uh, decide to, uh, uh, to uh, go under a, a gender assignment surgery, they don't understand that this is a very long uh, process which is hiding incredible pain. And um, so I wanted to, I wanted to uh, show that the, uh, once you have the opportunity to transition, uh, that brings a lot of happiness because basically what is happening is that uh, the inside is matching the outside and people pr uh, pursue you uh, finally for the very first time uh, the way you are. Yeah, I think I think it's um, really beautiful what you bring into the story. And I, I wondered, Matab, do you feel like there's some sort of relationship between, you know, it's interesting, isn't it? It's the story of Alex. Is it also a story of transformation and Venice and all uh, that sort of? Exactly. Yeah, it's, um, it was. And And for you, what would you like to... For people when they're watching the film, what are you hoping that they will get from it? Uh, for me, the first is the, the message is uh, to showing the beauty uh, and mystery that uh, I, I feel in Venice, you know. And um, of course, Alex, um, the, 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 to showing the uh, subtle and delicate souls of uh, Alex souls. I think, I think because 
we often hear about the city of Venice. Yes. Uh, do you feel like uh, this is, I, I know you're, you're teasing us, this is just an appetizer. Can you tell us a little bit about plans for what is to come? Well, the... <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> plans, it's uh, maybe another documentary to showing more and uh, maybe later Alex uh, will do the script of uh, his life. Alex? I think it's a beautiful, it will be a beautiful uh, future movie. Alex, what do you think? Well, you know, I'm, I'm working on a book actually, uh, or on a story to be adapted for screenplay. And, uh, but we are talking about a, a bigger film, a feature film um, or a series. Not, not clear yet, depends on the, on the future producers. Uh, but I'm also up for hire and I have another little short film in the freezer from 92 about an Irish uh, woman pirate queen uh, and her queer team or crew. So uh, that is going to come out next year. And uh, it was not uh, understood uh, 30, nearly 30 years ago. But I think now it's time for that to get reloaded. Absolutely. I think, I think maybe your time has come. So, so if, you, if you wanted to let people know, what do you think you learned about your time as, as a gondolier? Ooh, that's a, that's a very tricky question. <laughs> what did I learn? I learned that, uh, the, the, I think the main thing I learned is uh, not every uh, bad thing which happens to you comes to uh, hurt you. And sometimes you can only thank your enemy uh, for defeating you in certain battles. That's interesting. I think, I think, look, there's so much I'd like to ask you about. I, I wanted to congratulate you both. We're really pleased to have the film in Hebden Bridge Film Festival and we cannot wait to see what comes from both of you individually and together in the future. And thank you so much for taking the effort to come to us from Paris and from Sardinia all this way. And we congratulate you and look forward to the future. Thank, thank you, you so much. much. Great. Wonderful, Bye. thank you. Hello, I'm Louise Wadley, director of the Hebden Bridge Film Festival. And I am very delighted to welcome Mohammed Azazi director of the Inner Self, the short, with producer Amir and with translator Hamid. So thank you so much for joining us from Tehran. We're really excited to have the movie Inner Self in our short program. Hamid, I wonder if you could ask Mohammed if he could tell us the inspiration for the film. Khidmat shumwa salam arat kardan and tashakur kardan at bubat in ke join shodin bain برنامه در این کنفرانس و سوال کردن که چی باعث شد الهام بگین چی باعث الهام شما برای ساخت این فیلم شده سلام منم از سلام عرض میکنم خیلی خوشحالیم و تو این فستیوال هستیم و ای کاش این موقعیت کرونایی نبود و میتونستیم بودری در واقع باشیم اونجا تو خود فستیوال راستش این یه جورایی ترولوژی من دو تا کار دیگه دارم که اصولا خیلی ذهنیات هم این بود که چی میشد از طریق هنر به خصوص موسیقی ما میتونستیم نزدیک بشیم به به درون آدم ها راجعی یعنی که چه اتفاقی میفته اگه یک تو وسط یک جنجالی هنر وارد بشه و این, این توی کارا من دو تا کار قبلی هم اینجوری بودیم و این سومی یعنی ترولوژی در واقع توی فیلم های من علاقه از رو علاقه داره میاد این, این اتفاق اوکی 
The answer is uh, it's a trilogy. The movie is a part of a trilogy and the third part of it actually. And his idea is the actually the inspiration is he wanted to see how music and especially art can affect people. How can it uh, in uh, con connect people's feelings to each other? How how can music enter conflict and how can it resolve it? That's the in inspiration behind it because he's he says he's very interested in music and the effect of art on people. Okay, that's really interesting. And tell me, um, Mohammed, if you could tell me uh, a little bit about the performer, the main actress and the older woman, I thought their uh, interaction was really special, what you achieved in the performance. If you could talk very briefly about that. مهاجم خیلی کوتاه اگر بشه توضیح بدین یک مقدار راجع به نقش اول این خانومه و اون زن خانم مسنتری که اونجا بود میگه تقابل بین این دوتا خیلی جالب بود راجع به این دوتا یک توضیح کوتاهی بدین اولا که به خانم نیلوفر محبی نقش اصلی این کار رو کرده خانم دیالونیسه واقعا تو دنیای خودش هم یکی از دیالونیسه حالا حاضر خوبه در واقع ایرانیه که پروفانیام افتخار بود برای ما که شون بیاد برای این کار در واقع این کار رو بخوایم ما هم دیگه کار کنیم و اینکه این تضاده چجوری در اومده متاسفانه این خیلی مرسومه توی کشور ما که بعضی وقتا آدما و اون کاراکتر دوم که خانم مسنتره بعضی از آدما چیز میکنن در واقع ناخواسته وارد یه کاری میشن و برخلاف میلشون تو ارگان یا اون سازمان یا اون اداره کار میکنن و این تضاد هست اوکی the first role uh, ms nilofar mohabi is a very skilled violinist actually and they have uh, found her through a kind of audition as I can say and the interaction between the older woman and Ms. Nilofar as a violinist uh, is a condition, a very common condition in our country where people like the older woman enter a job and they have to follow some strict rules and they have to force some strict rules uh, unwantedly. They don't want to do it, but they have to. They have to show themselves the way they're not. They have to kind of express their feelings uh, different from whatever they feel exactly. Yeah, I think, I think you've achieved, Muhammad. I think you've achieved something very subtle and interesting because exactly that, we as the audience, maybe we start thinking that the older woman isn't very nice and she's not very sympathetic, but you have done something very interesting in revealing that everybody has a complicated relationship to uh, authority and a complicated relationship, how they have to survive in, in the world. So, um, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's really interesting. We thank you for that. And maybe Amir, you can tell us a little bit um, what his relationship to the material in the film and why he wanted to produce it. جناب زاره ای از شما میپرسن که ارتباط شما با فیلم چی بوده اصلا چی باعث شد که شما این فیلم رو تهیه کنید سلام عرض میکنم خدمتون خدمتون از کنم حالا ما از زمان دانشگاه من و محمد با هم دیگه دوستیم و چند دومین کار هستش که با هم دیگه داریم کار میکنیم و همکاری داریم ولی خب این فیلم یه مقدار متفاوت تره از بابت هم جنبه هنری و از بابت اون پیغام هایی که داره چون خیلی خاصتر بودش به خاطر همین دلیل دومش این بود که ما اینو ساختیم ولی دلیل اولش این بود که همه با هم دیگه دوستیم دلیل دومش هم که گفتم خدمت نه اوکی 
uh, Amir and Muhammad were uh, have been best friends for a long time after the university. They've been working together and they have worked on many different movies together. But this movie is a kind of different because the point of view about art, Amir was very interested in working on this movie more than the other movies that they have worked before. So it's interesting, isn't it? Because you, you have somehow brought a very interesting perspective to what seems like a small situation, but it is the power of music that has created Am I right? The relationship between the older woman and the younger woman who is feeling frustrated that we understand things. میگن که کار خیلی جالبی انجام دادین که دارین نشون میدین برخلاف اون چیزی که حالا بیننده تصور میکنن که این خانم خیلی سخت گیره اون خانم موسن شما کار رو جوری نشون دادین که هر کسی احساسات خودش رو داره و در نهایت میتونه این احساسات رو از طریق موسیقی و اینها بروز بده بیان کنه به هر حال موسیقی باعث میشه که شکوفا بشه این رو خیلی خوب نشون دادین مرسی خیلی ازتون ممنونم به خاطر این خیلی خوشحال از اینکه وارد فستیوال شده فیلمتون و به خاطر منتظرم که ببینم پروژه های بعدیتون هم وارد فستیوال های بشه خیلی ممنون من خیلی خوشحالم از این بابت و امیدوارم که هر چه زودتر این موقعیت تموم بشه و سالهای بعد فیلمسازا بتونن حضور پیدا کنن تو فستیوال این این رابطه ها خیلی خوبه They also thank you for this opportunity that you provided for them to enter the festival and he says he hopes for the covid-19 and these quarantine situation to pass off so they can meet face to face and they enter the festivals in person that communication between people is very important like that we couldn't agree more thank you so much everybody mm-hmm. mohammed amir hamid thank you very much we welcome thank you, you another time thank you thank you goodbye bye bye thank bye. you I'm delighted today to welcome Joan Stein Schimke, the director of Said, one of the shorts in the Hebden Bridge film competition for this year. And Joan is joining us from New York. Welcome, Joan. Thank you for having me. It's our pleasure. I'd like to jump right in and ask, what was the inspiration for this powerful drama? So I was working with uh, my co-writer on uh, developing a story Uh, to make a short film about a refugee family who came to the United States after uh, escaping from Syria. Um, it, the inspiration was really the image, there was an image of a young boy who had washed ashore on the beach in Turkey, you know, as, as, as the family was trying to get across the sea to, to make it to Greece. And uh, John, my, uh, my partner, had a son that was about the same age and he was just traumatized by this photo and it really inspired both of us I mean as was I and it really inspired both of us that, to make a film about the situation of a refugee family who has escaped war. Yeah, I think I think one of the things that was really striking about the film was everyone thinks it's kind of over. You make it to safety, you make it to another country, you're allowed to be right. there. But what I think the film really beautifully Uh, explains in the plight of the dad and 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 his doubts and everything is what happens afterwards exactly and that's what we wanted to show like we didn't want to show you know everything that happened during the war it's it's the the scars and the wounds that you carry with you afterwards but also the the trauma sometimes you know you have this this deep trauma and how do you tell your children You know, how do you explain to them that somebody has died or that life is just never going to be the same again? So I think that we see the film through the eyes of Aya, the young daughter who's nine years old, and the father being unable to really express his anguish to her and how she has to come to deal with that reality. I wanted to uh, pick you up 
because as well, the little girl who played Aya, she is really, her performance is so beautiful and she represents that incredible innocence you have as a child, but, but she obviously has a knowledge that she understands there's something going on with her dad. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it was so nice to um, meet her, the actress, because she'd never acted before. She's actually the daughter of one of my colleagues, also at Adelphi, and she was so excited to do this role. I mean, it was very, very emotional for her. Her mother, uh, Sarah, is um, uh, Egyptian, and uh, so Alina's Egyptian American, and her mother didn't hide a lot of the facts from her and actually showed her one of the videos that she showed her. It was just a, a, a very emotional one about the children in a Syrian orphanage in Syria who were crying out for help and saying, please, please help us, please save us. And Alina watched this and she became so emotionally distraught. <laughs> um, but her mother wanted her to see like what other children are going through. So she really brought that into, I think, her performance. And she had a she had such a wonderful innocence, but also maturity about the subject matter um, and trying to understand her role and in uh, and, and this film. It's, it's interesting because her father at first didn't want her to make the movie like, oh, she's in school, you know, she's a child. But then afterwards, he was really like amazed at her at her performance and so happy that she had done it yes I think I think you've picked up there as well she has this beautiful feeling about her because she is innocent she desperately wants to play with the other kids and everything but there's this feeling behind of what's happened could you tell me a little bit about the actor who plays the dad in the film yes that's Laith Nakli and Laith is from Syria and he came here in the 90s I think um, uh, he actually plays uh, the uncle in the Rami uh, TV series on Hulu. He's a wonderful actor and his friend who is actually the actress who played his wife. Um, she had told him about this script and because I didn't, I was working with the casting director and he, his name hadn't come up, but she had told him about it and she brought him to the audition. And he just nailed it. I mean, he was so emotionally invested in this um, in this role, and I, I was so happy to have someone of his character and depth, who whose parents were still living in Syria and Damascus, like during the war. So he understood so much of of what was happening. And actually, his friend, who <laughs> another Syrian actor who um, was in Syria during the war and finally came to the US, he played the guy at the beginning of the film when he was looking through the wreckage. So we really had a sense of, of the, the severity of the whole situation and the intensity of it through, through their perspectives and their acting. So Laith was, Laith was amazing, so emotional, so powerful. Yeah, I think, yeah. I think you're right. And, and, you know, it's a short film, but somehow he carries that gravitas and everything. I mean, as a director, you know that when someone has that depth as an actor, it comes across on the screen. We haven't got, I'd love to talk to you forever, Joan, but what I'd love you to tell us is what's on the horizon for you coming up? Well, I'm working on a um, feature length screenplay, writing it. And uh, hopefully that'll be done in the next couple of months because <laughs> I've been working on it for a really long time. And I have to say my work, my previous work, I, I deal with historical drama. What, one of my first short films that dealt with World War II, I, I made a film about the solidarity movement in, in Poland. So I'm very much interested in historical drama and how the past affects us even into the future, you know, through the generations and what that means for us as uh, human beings uh, in society, how we forgive each other, how we forgive ourselves, how we live with the guilt of the past. So those are some of the issues that I'm trying to deal with in this new uh, feature film that I'm making. Well, we can't wait to see what you bring us because I think uh, those are fascinating topics. And thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Louise. Hi, and I'm here with the director of Anatomy of a Crooked Spine, Kate Morrison. Welcome, Kate. Hello. <laughs> nice to see you. Where are we talking to you from? Uh, from Leeds. From? Leeds. 
Leeds, great, lovely. And Kate, um, I was very inspired by your film. I wonder if you could give us a little bit of background to it. What was it inspired by? Yeah, um, so it's about scoliosis. Um, and I had scoliosis when I was 13. Um, I had two surgeries to correct it. Um, and I wanted to make something that was kind of uh, celebratory of like the power of the body to kind of um, change and grow and kind of become stronger. Um, well, yeah. You've certainly done that. I think the film is, um, for those people who haven't seen it yet, the film is a beautiful uh, coverage of a dance. So we have a, a, a ballerina. Did you um, particularly want to have a dance sequence? Yeah, so I've not worked with dance and film before, but I really felt like dance was like the perfect medium to do it. Um, just something that's like graceful and strong, but you know, kind of contrast with like the rope stuff. Yeah, I, I think um, one of the things that's very powerful about the film is the juxtaposition between the filming of the beautiful dancer and the routine and obviously something much more tangible in terms of the rope and the screws and all that sort of mm. thing. Do you want to talk a little bit about the inspiration for that? Um, yeah, so it was kind of just like the brutality of it. So like this industrial rope, which was like really, really heavy as well. So Alice and the dancer did like an amazing job of like lifting it up and throwing it around all day, like incredible dancer. Um, yeah, and like the screws and stuff, that kind of harshness to really contrast with like the grace of the, the dance routine. And can you tell us a little bit about the whole thing about, for you, you know, you had scoliosis and you had to have surgeries. What, what, what are you trying to tell people, I guess, about the, the, the kind of expression in this film? Mm. Um, that's a good question. Uh, just kind of how, I mean, all bodies change and all bodies grow, you know, and different things, you know, happen in life that change your body. Like, um, I didn't want it to be kind of like a sad story, like, oh no, I've had this surgery, it's really awful. It's more like, well, okay, I've had this surgery, and now my body's strong, and it's, I feel like a lot of people will be able to relate to that, like different things that happen in their life that actually make them be stronger, and it's not a bad thing. <laughs> Yeah, I think I think one of the things that's very uh, striking about the film is that you've kind of taken charge of the story mm. and that the um, extraordinarily beautiful aesthetic of the film makes it very powerful. Would you like to tell us, are there other things on the drawing board for you? Um, what I'm working on at the moment, do you mean? Yeah, you're thinking in lockdown, well, I should be able to write 100 films or something. Um, well, I'm actually in my final year at uni, so I've been finishing uni work at the moment. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm working on a couple of different scripts that are very different to the things I've made in the past. But yeah, kind of moving forward. Fantastic. Yeah. And tell me, um, what do you think the kind of uh, way forward in terms of COVID and, and studying and all that? How's that been at uni? Um, I'm not going to lie, it's been a bit of a struggle. Uh, my laptop and Wi-Fi is really unreliable. So like lectures have been a bit of a pain. Um, especially with like a creative degree. So it's like practical. So I do filmmaking and photography. Um, but you know, it, I can't really complain too much. It's, it's not the end of the world. Um, yeah, I still managed to do it. Um, but yeah, it's, it's been different. It's been a different year. Yeah, I think I think almost everybody has had a, some kind of different year, haven't they? Yeah. Well, listen, oh, yeah. We are we are really just delighted to have it as part of the short film competition oh, at Captain you. Bridge, and 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 so much wishing you well for the future and looking forward to what you make next. Ah, oh, thanks very much. Thanks for having me.